Okay. So now I'm going to talk about Sprint. Hugo kept on saying that this is going to be sort of the continuation of what he spoke about, but you're not going to see it obviously. And I mean, it's not going to be obvious. And I want to say that Sprint is an acronym of the name that follows, but the truth is that's very hard to see also. So anyway, Sprint has some acronym which relates to some words uh, uh, connected to this paper. And it's work with um, uh, Fabrice Ben Hamouda, Shaya Levy, Hugo, and Yiping Ma, who's a student of mine at uh, UPenn. So what did we set out to do? We wanted um, to solve threshold Schnorr signatures. We're not the first. Most likely, we're not going to be the, lead, the last. There have been many, many uh, implementations of this. But we felt that uh, existing solutions were complex and somewhat inefficient and had some issues. And of course, as any paper, we wanted to improve of that. We wanted to give. Uh, efficient solutions. Why did we want to do this? Why did we even want to offer threshold uh, Schnorr signatures or any threshold uh, functionality? Why are you interested in those? I will explain shortly what threshold um, uh, signatures and encryption are. But for now, just think that if you have a blockchain, your blockchain can sign and can encrypt, uh, or decrypt, really. Encrypt anybody can, even a baby, but decrypt. And what would be the applications? But before I go into that, I want to say, why is it surprising? Why are we even um, thinking that it would be an issue that a blockchain would sign? But you should think about it, that the blockchain, there is no uh, secrecy there on the blockchain. Everything is visible to everyone. So where do you have keys? These functionalities of signing and decrypting require secret keys. So where are those keys? We'll get into that shortly of how we're going to do it. But what would we do with it? I mean, maybe we can do it, but why if it doesn't help anyone? So there are really beautiful and very, very powerful applications that you can do if a blockchain, if a blockchain can have these um, functionalities. For example, if a blockchain can sign, it can take its state and it can sign it and provide it to another blockchain. And that blockchain could use that state as the definitive um, state of all the accounts in the blockchain that provided the proof. So clearly something very important. If it could... Um, uh, a decrypt, then you could do very interesting applications. For example, somebody could put an encrypted will on the blockchain. So now there's privacy for that encrypted will. And this encrypted will is monitored by a smart contract. And if a death certificate is provided to the smart contract, then the blockchain will decrypt the will, and the will will be transferred to the people who are supposed to get the will. So you can see that this is an extremely powerful tool. What I said is just two examples. I think in the more is really tons of things that anybody can think of. Many times you hear people saying, oh, if only my smart contract could sign or my smart contract could decrypt, I could do this, this, and that. And I really think that once these things are implemented on blockchains, and blockchains can provide these functionalities, in fact, all the applications will bloom like uh, mushrooms after the rain. Okay, so this is why we want it. So now you know, how can we sign? How can we decrypt? This is what's interesting. So... What is, uh, I wrote here, threshold signatures, but the converse applies for um, encryption. But since I'm going to be talking about Schnorr signatures, in fact, I'm mostly going to be saying signatures. But you should know that threshold is really an area that deals both with signing and with decryption. Okay, so what is the setting? 
we have a world of end parties and um, there is what we would want is that there would be a public key that is associated with the blockchain and the secret key, which is the pair of that public key, which, as I said, any cryptographic functionality, signing and encryption has this pair, secret key, public key, if it's in the public key world. And um, we would want the secret key not to be held by a single entity, but we would want it to be distributed amongst that little group up there, those people sort of marked in that black circle. Why do we want to share this key? I'll get to it in a second, but let me just finish the description. And once that there is a message M that the blockchain or the smart contract or somebody wants signed, this message is transferred to that little subset, and that subset will generate a signature on the message M, which is exactly equivalent to the signature which would have been generated if a single entity had held SK and had signed. Okay? So this is our goal. And Hugo talked about it, that in our world there are parties who are not so nice, not like us. And sometimes they could do bad things. So we want to assume that everything will work, even that little uh, black group is of size N, even if T of them are faulty. We still want to deliver our solutions. And um, what we would want in our solutions is that they, synchronous, of course, is easier to deliver. We would also want them to be asynchronous. I, I was just at a talk on Friday uh, by Victor Shoup from Definity, and he said, why are people talking about synchronous? Synchronous doesn't make any sense. So we also want, that's Victor's um, style of talking. But um, I want to say we do want to deliver asynchronous protocols. So a very brief history about um, threshold signatures or threshold cryptography. It was introduced by Boyd, uh, Desmet, and Frankel in the um, early 90s. And they really thought threshold cry cryptography, you can think about it as a subset of MPC, because what is it? It's a subset of parties computing some function, which is exactly the definition of MPC. But threshold cryptography was all about making things efficient, making the cryptographic functionalities much more efficient. And um, a, so they introduced that, and then there were all kinds of protocols that were done through the 2000s, and uh, we had a paper about uh, distributed key generation, which you need for these cryptographic functions, and the threshold DSA. DSA is the uh, digital signature standard. And we designed these protocols. We did think about efficiency, but not at its highest levels. And in fact, when blockchain came around in the um, uh, uh, 2010s, people started saying, we really need these things because now cryptographic signing keys have become expense valuable, right? Because if they're signing transactions, they really hold the money of that wallet. So you really want to ensure um, that they have um, stronger safety guarantees and so on. And then our solutions, which we had in the mid-90s, 2000s, were all based on some polynomial uh, design. I'll explain shortly what it is. But that, they felt, was not efficient enough and they moved to additive um, uh, computations, I'll explain also. And they did this for ECDSA, for elliptic curves DSA, and for Schnorr. And there's a whole line of works that do this. Okay. But efficiency, these, this change that they did of moving from polynomial representation to additive representation, don't worry what it is yet, um, came at a cost. And what was the cost? 
We said that we wanted the protocols to be robust. Some of the parties could fail, but we'd still be able to complete our tasks. But in, in the additive setting, what did it mean? It meant that the secret key was shared in an additive manner over that little set, okay? But if you need to sign and you need all these pieces, if one party fails, you've lost your uh, ability to sign. So these additive solutions lost in robustness. They could not tolerate faults. They would need to stop and restart, which you might say, okay, that's not a loss in robustness because, okay, you stop, you start again, you'll still sign eventually. Okay, I'm willing to accept this argument. However, in that setting, because of this loss of robustness and needing to restart and something about the asynchronous model, you can never, these solutions cannot be asynchronous. So we were losing something and we wanted to, to, to do more. So what? We want to go back to the future. We want to take our polynomial representations and try to give solutions now that are good as and efficient as the additive solutions, but still have robustness in the sense that you don't need to rewind, but also protocols that are actually robust and can work in the asynchronous setting. Okay, so we want to go to the polynomial representation again. But there must have been a reason that people moved away from the polynomial representation. And what happened is, and as I have three minutes, we're going to go a bit faster. I have three minutes plus five, but okay. The, the polynomial protocols that we had, and despite the fact that when we designed them and we believed in it, we really thought that they were efficient, they really were expensive in communication and in computation. Okay, but this is part of how research does evolve in our understanding of what really it means to be efficient and to run things. Uh, we advance also with the times, and um, that is why this now is considered to be expensive on these fronts. Okay, so um, another um, issue is that... Um, so there is some operation which is carried out when you use polynomials, which is carried out by dealers, and they send information to parties that are called shareholders. And in these polynomial um, sharings, which we need to do, we need to know that there are enough dealers and enough shareholders. And this is a protocol um, to identify this fact, which requires um, a... It introduces complexity into the protocols. Okay. And um, what was um, another motivation that we had for ourselves is to try and do these solutions in the setting of a blockchain because we have a broadcast and we were hoping that the broadcast would help us improve our solutions utilizing that because the blockchain, that's exactly what it is. And um, our solutions also um, relate to these small groups, which Hugo also talked about. In the Yoso model, you want to do things in a sm small group over your whole universe because these protocols, they are really quadratic. And they become extremely expensive. Even if you're talking about 10,000 parties, let alone a million, and if you can do things over small groups, um, this makes a big difference in the design. So this was something that we wanted to do. So what is one thing that we managed to do? I had told you that we had in the uh, 2000s or maybe late uh, 1990s, we had a protocol for distributed key generation, which is a critical protocol because you don't want a key if you can avoid it. You don't want a key to be generated by a trusted party. You want a key to be 
generated in a way that at no time is it known to everyone, to anyone, sorry. So that somehow parties can create this key together. So we had that original result, but our current result, we can do um, distributed key generation, but I have five more. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so we can do a thousand key generations for the price of one uh, key generation. And, um, and, and assigning all, uh, sorry. So we can do all these things and we, in fact, use both old and new techniques, which is very nice that you can rely on things that have been built in the past, sort of, you don't invent everything from scratch, and people have done wonderful research in the past. But when you combine them together, they give a much powerful result. So we have um, uh, packing, super invertible matrices, SIMD, and much more. I uh, put stars on things that I am um, not going to talk about today, but I think I should have put on more stars, giving the time. I'll go quickly. So uh, our solutions that we designed for these things, for these threshold Schnorr signatures, are already effective and achieve improvement for the case where the, that committee, that small committee that is computing, is of size 10. But it still remains feasible when we get into committees of over a thousand. And we can do these things like substituting committees and so on that uh, Hugo discussed. And um, <clears throat> as I said, our protocols are asynchronous. And we have some trade off between efficiency and the resilience of the protocol. Okay? We said that we would want that T parties could be faulty out of N. But if we're willing to say, okay, not T, but T plus five, um, uh, sorry, uh, T minus five, at most T minus five can be faulty, then you can improve efficiency. So it's a very nice trade-off, and depending on your applications, you can decide to choose where you want to fix that trade-off. Okay, this we're not going to go over. Okay. Um, here is another um, very nice uh, technique which we um, have in our paper, which also existed in prior works. I think that in Andrew Miller's work it appeared. It's this idea that you can um, share information. I said before the dealers need to share information. You can share this information and verify by the people around that the dealer is doing whatever it needs to be doing. It's a little vague and I can't get into the details, but we provide a specific uh, implementation of this in our paper and this greatly um, helps in efficiency because, for example, for the distributed key generation protocol, which I discussed, it enables us to reduce the protocol from three rounds to two rounds. So we get a, a huge boost. I mean, it's a third of the rounds less. Okay. So, as I said, it enables everybody to see if the dealer is faulty or not, and this helps us in our uh, construction. Okay, I'm going to skip this. I want to give you just a flavor of what we did um, with the Schnorr signatures. This is the Schnorr um, algorithm um, for signing genius protocol, unfortunately was patented, which brought about the design of uh, DSA. So what would be a naive way to do Schnorr? It would be you would take this, the key S, as I had said before, if it was additive, it would be S1 plus S2 and so on, but you share it with a polynomial. This is what I said don't get into the details too much. And the shareholders also need some randomness in shared form, Ki. And then you compute the E the way you normally do. And then you simply, each shareholder gives us E Si plus Ki. And you interpolate them to get the signature. 
This is really only if you know Schnorr, this could mean something to you, but I have 40 seconds, and this is what we're going to get. And then um, what we want to do, as I said, every signature needs its own randomness. So we can create randomness by packing more information into a single polynomial. Again, if you do not know what secret sharing is, it doesn't matter. What we're saying is, with one action of sharing, instead of getting a single randomness, you can get a set of randomness. And this is the packing. And now, um, you need some more techniques, which I'm going to sp skip because I have zero seconds. And um, then we pack the... Um, uh, randomness, then we pack the secret key also, which is a little bit surprising to anybody. Why would you want to pack the same secret multiple times? And then with the bang, we use SIMD technology ideas in order to create all the signatures in one swoop, because we multiply everything together, you need a bit more. Okay. So I said, let's pause. It was in order to continue, but I think I will just summarize. So what our um, solution enabled us to do is to do um, Schnorr signatures very efficiently to be able to sign multiple times. And through this fact that we went back to the polynomial representation, we were able to reintroduce um, robustness and to enable asynchronous um, a, a, an asynchronous model and really um, to achieve um, efficiency in a big way. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned there's a trade off between the resilience and, uh, and the efficiency. Yeah, so what is uh, the, the range of uh, threshold you can tolerate? Is this one-third, but then if you relax that, you can... So what we need to do, every time that we pack, you need to uh, increase the degree of the polynomial. So you see it's exactly related to that. If you add, if you pack A values, then you lose uh, in the resilience according to the exact measurements that you think. Oh, Wait, I want to be more, a bit more accurate, okay? This is for the packing. But once we do the Schnorr signature, we have a multiplication. So, in fact, we're losing even more because uh, we have to multiply two polynomials of degree uh, T plus A. So, we're losing even more. But you have to look at the numbers exactly. Any other questions? He's being intimidated. Okay, so what we do is, we, um, do you know secret sharing? Then I'll give you a more exact thing. Okay, so when the dealer shares a secret, it gives each party a, its secret SI, but then the parties need to verify that they all got points on the appropriate polynomial. So what would be a verifiable thing? The dealer will put encryptions of all the shares, and we'll give a proof that the decryption of all these shares is a polynomial of degree T or whatever degree you need. And the thing about this encryption is that if my share is incorrect in some way, I can open it and show that it's not the proper thing. And and that's why we save around because now we don't need the dealer to respond. Everybody immediately sees that the guy is nasty. But I think um, you had this, something like that in one of your papers. I think at least I gave you credit for it in the related work. <laughs> okay. <laughs>